من این بیدار و کم تونی اتاق نیست هست از این این دستید نفاظت منی باید فاگیست دارم به بیست دارم 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 I'm Janet and I'm from Exeter and I've been coming for a few months I think and I'm just finding it really interesting to learn more. Okay. I'm John Dean and um, I live just outside Exeter and I heard about positive money just around about the time of the last general election when I was standing for the National Health Action Party in the uh, Central Devon constituency and um, to, I started to try and mug up a bit on economics and realised very quickly that everything I'd learned so far was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Seifert, I'm interested in the origins of money and in how money mystifies and obscures reality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Kastner and an occasional <coughs> attendee. I'm very interested in uh, positive money in terms of uh, a, a radical overhaul of the existing system, which I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm Tony Pugh, one of the original founder members. Uh, I also happen to be a treasurer as well, so I should be after your money at the end of the evening. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm Cam Bowie, uh, again a, a founder member from Axminster, and very interested, like you, in a radical approach. We need to change the system radically, I think, and it's how we go about doing that. George, can we? Can you and your partner introduce my partner? Yeah, all my process. Hey! <laughs> uh, um, yeah. For the purposes of the recording, I, I, I am the technician man. Um, generally, we don't pick up women as well. So if women could, I'm not being sexist, it's just generally you've got softer voices, so if women could speak up a little bit more, we'll be able to catch you more easily on recording. Um, That's if people are happy for him to record, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it goes on the our Facebook page, uh, doesn't it? It will go on a, we have a YouTube page even, but there will be a oh, lot right. on the Facebook page as a later point. Yeah. If you're happy with that, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the people who, who aren't here can at least uh, find out what we're doing. Um, I've known about positive money for about three years. I was in France when I found out about it. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, uh, but I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could do much from in France. But I came back to the UK about two years ago and I got a little bit more involved in this group and have been recording stuff. Which um, yeah. Hi, I'm Andy. Um, I'm here to support John really because he talks about positive money all the time and I want to understand <laughs> what he's on about. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, it was a meeting because I did one uh, probably like six, six or seven months ago. I can't remember which one it was, but it was quite interesting. But I, I felt like I could use one of these talks where the strategy is. Uh, talked about and if you help me understand a bit more what it is, I thought a bit like a one on one um, talk for me, I guess. Yeah. Great. Jamie. Yeah, uh, so I'm Jamie, I'm a student up at the University of Exeter and I did my placement year last year at the Bank of England. Um, so got interested in positive money before that, went Ben Dyson ben 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 talk at the University about three years ago, which originally how I found out about it and been interested in since. Great. Right, well thanks everybody, and there'll be a, looks like there are a few more people coming in, but let's, the, the announcements are, uh, next meeting next month, we were going to have Jill, uh, people know Jill, she's a Green Party candidate for Honiton and Tiverton, and she runs uh, Exeter Pan, and she's going to talk about framing the economy. There's a new report coming out, and it's really how to explain to the public what we we talk about and how we, how we can change. It. So it's a it's a very interesting topic for us because we do find it difficult, don't we? So, um, but Jamie has also agreed kindly to give us a talk, and he leaves Exeter 
assuming you pass your exam. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the end, towards the end of June. So I'm going to actually ask Jill if she'll do her her talk in at the end of June, and Jamie, if you'll do yours at the end of May. Would that be possible? Yeah. It'll be. Are you in the middle of exams then? It'll um, be the 31st. My last, my last one's on the 16th. This is the 31st of May. Okay. Uh, I might be in Italy for a conference. Ah, but it could be the week before. Okay. I'll, I'll so I'll let you know, everybody. Um, but Jamie has agreed to talk about. There's been a new publication in the Oxford uh, Economics Policy Review, a huge uh, publication on how we need to change macroeconomics in the world. And he's going to talk about. Uh, there's a couple of papers on the Bank of England and how it does its modelling and so forth. So I thought you might, we might like to hear about that uh, next time. So if we can fix that up, we will. And then Jill will do June. And then July, if you remember, each year we have our sort of AGM thing. And we usually have a film or something as well. And we haven't had anything by Steve Keane. And I, that's actually a mistake. We really should, because he speaks uh, uh, beautifully in his Australian <laughs> Excellent. And uh, so, uh, but he's, he's done, a, I found a half hour talk that he's done on, on uh, YouTube, and I thought we might have that as well as the AGM. So it'll be, a, hopefully, it'll be an interesting thing. As, and he'll be talking about uh, MMT, money. Modern monetary theory. Yeah, mm. that sort of thing. So if you're happy with, are you happy with that as the way we proceed? Mm. Or have you got better ideas? Because if you have, please, please let, let me know. So I'll email, but it probably will be, end of May will be Jamie, end of June will be Jill on framing the economy, and end of July will be a Steve Keen film. Okay. So with that, can I introduce uh, Paul very much for coming, and over to you. David, would you do the, uh, the light? Okay, well, hello, and uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to come and talk to you today, and thanks very much to Cam uh, for arranging. Um, apologies, first of all, that I'm obviously not Rachel Oliver, um, our head of campaigns and organising, who was originally planning to come and talk to you today. Um, Rachel's been a little unwell recently, so I have to come uh, in her place, but she's thankfully on the event. Um, so I'm afraid you're stuck with me. Um, so I am the Chief Operating Officer of Positive Money, um, and that means that my, my day job is to manage all of our internal operations, our finance, HR, IT, uh, fundraising, uh, those sorts of things, um, but also to help Fran, our Executive Director, with the leadership of the organisation, uh, and to manage some of our programmes of work. Um, so I'm a relative newcomer to Positive Money. I only joined in September 2018, uh, so 2017, sorry. Um, by contrast, many of you have been involved for many years. Um, so I'm really pleased to come and hear your thoughts on the organisation. And please bear with me if there are gaps in my knowledge uh, as a newcomer. Um, I think Positive Money remains unique amongst public policy focused organisations um, in having a dedicated grassroots network. Um, your participation, I think, is vital to our success. Um, all the events I've been to, I'm continually impressed with the dedication and commitment and, and knowledge of our supporters. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, the title I've been given is, is Where's Positive Money Come From um, and Where Are We Going? And so um, what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to be interested in, in Positive Money uh, and to join it. Um, a bit about Positive Money's progress uh, to date uh, and what the organisation looks like now. Uh, and then a look at our current strategy uh, and the thinking behind it. Um, and then there'll be some time uh, afterwards for discussion amongst the group and for some Q&A as well. So, first of all, just a little about uh, how I came to be involved with Positive Money. So everyone I've met uh, at Positive Money since I started seems to have a story of how they came to get involved um, amongst our staff, amongst our supporters, our board members and advisors, uh, and, and uh, everybody who's involved. It, these often have a sort of scales fell from my eyes sort of uh, vibe to them, or a road to Damascus conversion. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about mine and why I wanted to work here. Um, so I can always remember feeling generally uneasy uh, about the dominance of, the, of banks and the financial sector in our uh, country. 
Um, I remember at university in the early 2000s feeling just a sort of general worry that the only companies that seem to uh, uh, visibly advertise for graduates to join them um, or to sponsor events and sponsor sports teams um, tended to be banks and financial services firms. So I remember thinking, you know, where are the big manufacturers, where are the big tech firms, uh, the energy giants or big pharma, or where, where's the government and civil, civil service, um, where are the big charities in the NHS? Um, and it felt like a world where, in the early 2000s, the kind of default place to go for, for kind of bright young graduates was to go and, was, was by default to go and work for Goldman Sachs or Deloitte or something like that. Um, and then in 2008, we had the financial crash. And I think it's hard now, uh, 10 years on, to recall uh, quite how much of a shock this was. Um, all these unassailable financial giants um, suddenly seemed exposed as quite hollow. And I, I remember having a, a general sense of it. Um, uh, these, these firms that, that seemed like foundations of the world um, seemed to be made of, of sand. Um, their actions seemed foolish and dangerous. Uh, their leaders incompetent or worse. Um, I, I was working in Japan and China at the time as an English teacher, um, basically putting off growing up and deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And with a bit too much free time on my uh, hands, I started to read more and more about money uh, and the banking system. And I remember feeling astonished uh, watching a video about uh, fractional reserve banking um, and how money is created. And the fact that most um, uh, money, uh, electronic money, is magic up on a computer. I'd never given much thought before to where money comes from, um, but I'd always imagined that it was somehow more um, solid and, and reliable than that. Um, so when I came back to the UK, I was quite eager to work in public policy and politics. Um, I eventually got a job at the Institute for Public Policy Research, uh, which is one of the, the mainstream established think tanks. And I worked there for the last six years um, prior to coming to Positive Money. At IPPR, I saw some brilliant work done on all sorts of policy areas. Um, from uh, welfare to migration to education to health, uh, energy and the environment. And I saw how it's possible to shape a public policy agenda and to influence politicians. Um, but with a few exceptions, we, we never seem to get into very deep structural reform of the economy, uh, and in particular of our monetary system. And this always seemed quite odd to me, since the most important economic event of the last half century, the 2008 crash, uh, was a direct product of the freedom uh, and the immense and unchecked power that commercial banks had. Uh, so the response from most governments around the world so far has been to, to largely paper over the cracks, um, uh, for political parties to blame one another, um, or to just wash their hands of it and say um, it's the way it is, as if financial crashes were, were just a sort of force of nature like the weather um, that we just have to deal with, rather than the result of specific decisions. Um, so after working there for a long time, when I started looking around for other roles and came across Positive Money, who I'd been vaguely aware of but hadn't really looked at in detail before, I felt like that's what I've been looking for. Um, that represents really radical uh, and structural change in the economy, and that's exactly the sort of thing that governments should be looking at. So that's how I came to be uh, interested in and involved with Positive Money. Um, I think it's one of the most exciting NGOs uh, around at the moment, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. So, that's enough about me. Um, let's dive in about where positive money has come from uh, and where it's going. So I want to start with a quick summary of our vision. Um, so we think that the, uh, what, what's the problem? We think the current money and banking system, the way money is created and the, the powers that commercial banks currently have, uh, causes high levels of debt and rising inequality. It causes house price bubbles, it lays the foundations for financial crises, and it harms our environment. Um, and furthermore, there's a, a democratic deficit. There's a huge amount of power residing in the boards of commercial banks, um, rather than it being something publicly accountable. So what do we want? What's our vision? Um, our sort of tagline is that we, uh, uh, we want a money and banking system that serves a fair, democratic, and sustainable economy. So we want an economy that isn't reliant on housing bubbles or stock market booms, uh, on unsustainable levels of inequality. We want an economy that is stable, um, with more secure jobs, less household and government debt, uh, which doesn't automatically lead towards inequality. We want an economy where the Bank of England works with the government in a democratic way um, to implement policies that work for society rather than against it, and where implicit subsidies for banks are removed uh, and a, a more diverse ecosystem of banks uh, is uh, created to serve the needs of society uh, rather than the other way around. 
So that's a quick recap of our uh, vision of the world. Looking back at what we've done. So we were founded uh, in 2010, um, growing out of the work of Ben Dyson and his, his blog, um, in response to the crash. Because no one was really talking in the fallout of the crash about um, how banks create money uh, and the role of this uh, in creating the financial crash. So our first book um, by Ben Dyson, Modernising Money, uh, was a, a landmark study in this problem and how it could be addressed. And over the years, we've built up a portfolio of other research papers uh, on various aspects of the monetary system um, across a, a range of, of different issues on digital cash, uh, on uh, growth dependency, uh, and how money creation uh, works. What have we done since we began? So, We've, we've built ourselves up into a quite well-established organisation with vibrant and growing networks both in the public uh, and also with key influences uh, in politics and the media, uh, with economists. Um, when we began, money reform wasn't widely talked about um, and we've very slowly uh, managed to drag this issue uh, out of the fringes and more and more into the mainstream. Um, such that the, this subject is now talked about far more at the level of, of central banks and at the, the IMF. Um, other examples, in, in response to our work, that, partly in response to our work, the Bank of England published a paper um, in its quarterly bulletin in 2014, um, confirming many of the things that we've been saying about how money is created uh, and putting to bed some of the misconceptions around it. Um, we've become recognised as a, as a thought leader on money reform and monetary policy. Um, uh, we managed to get money creation debated in Parliament for the first time in 170 years. Uh, we've done surveys of MPs uh, exposing uh, their ignorance and, and misunderstandings about how money is created, um, uh, which is far more than you think. Um, we've, we've got growing links with the, the Treasury and the Bank of England. Uh, we've done a range of, of petitions, um, including just recently, um, some of you may have signed um, our petition to the Treasury Select Committee um, recommending the introduction of, of digital cash. Um, we'll be submitting evidence to their ongoing inquiry into digital currencies this year. Um, also, I think in response to our work, some of the, the more mainstream think tanks, um, including my own former home of IPPR, are beginning to look at monetary reform um, and releasing papers on it. So I think this, this shows how positive money has played an important role in bringing this subject out of the fringes and, and a bit more into the the mainstream. I think six to seven years ago it was largely unheard of uh, in the media or, or amongst politicians. Uh, a few big stats. So we now have 45,000 subscribers to our newsletter, uh, 67,000 followers on Facebook, 23,000 Twitter followers. Um, we've trained 200 people uh, as UK network leaders. We get about 50 press missions a year and we've got 30 local groups. Um, we've been getting on the telly a lot recently, um, so Fran, our executive director, has become a regular talking head uh, on BBC News, um, talking about things like the Lloyds Bitcoin ban um, and the, uh, the charges against Barclays over Qatari loans. Um, and we've had some growing press coverage as well. Um, we, we even got a feature in the Daily Mail's This Is Money, which I didn't know reaches millions of, of readers each month, um, so the whole sort of double page spread about our, our work. And we've also become more and more, um, well, we've had better and better relationships with influential and important people. Um, so we've started to do events with the likes of Martin Wolf and Ed Balls. Uh, we've done three parliamentary launches uh, in the past nine months of, of our research papers. We've got another one planned for May uh, with numerous MPs across different parties. Um, and we've brought together um, a lot of eminent economists uh, in support of our ideas. Um, we don't always agree with each other on everything, um, but we're generally becoming regarded as, a, as, a, as an important voice on the subject. And then there's, there's you guys, our network. Um, so we have a, an ever-increasing group of uh, local, uh, of grassroots network people, um, uh, split up into local groups all over the country. Um, so just in the last year, we had nine new local groups um, spring up in uh, Southampton, Leeds, Oxford, Brighton, um, uh, Bath, East London and Derbyshire. Um, 
And I think this is, this is testament to how this is not only becoming uh, more and more uh, a mainstream subject uh, amongst um, politicians and the media, but also just in, in the sort of court of public opinion. There's, there's growing followings on our social media challenge, uh, channels. Um, we've had some viral content, uh, such as our video about Theresa May's comments on the magic money tree, which has reached millions of people. Uh, and now we've started the new youth network as well, um, as our, our, our supporters' um, average age is, is higher than we would like. So we want to bring in some young people as, as well, as it, um, it tends to be uh, 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 older people so far that have got involved in Positive Money's work. Um, we're very keen to reach out to a new audience as much as we, as much as we can. And finally, we're trying to spearhead an international movement. Um, so we set up uh, a couple of years ago the International Movement for Monetary Reform, um, which is an umbrella organization um, for all of the organizations around the world working on monetary reform. Um, so there's now 23 across five continents. Um, we, we're not kind of formally aligned with these. We don't always agree with each other on all subjects. Um, but we, we wanted to set up this sort of um, uh, umbrella that they can kind of be uh, 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 connected with each other th uh, through, so that they can do um, communal events and work with each other on projects. Um, and we started to partner with other international agents on some uh, initiatives as well. In terms of our own work, we've also set up um, some new ventures abroad. So we've set up Positive Money Europe um, to take our message to the European Central Bank, uh, which now has its own website and brand identity, um, and will be launching formally uh, later this year. Um, we're trying to follow a similar path uh, in America and hoping to set up uh, something like Positive Money US. Um, and we're currently working with contacts in Washington DC to see if we can uh, find the funding and resource to establish ourselves there as well. Um, and if we can achieve that, then we'll have a, a lobbying presence um, in the same town as three of the four biggest central banks uh, in the world. Um, so the Bank of England uh, in London, the European Central Bank in Brussels, the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C., uh, with the exception of the Bank of Japan in Tokyo. Um, so maybe that's one for the, for the future. And then lastly, just on our growth. Uh, so we've grown quite a lot, particularly in the last three years. So when we started, we were quite small, a turnover around 100,000. And then between 2016 and 2018, we started to attract a lot more significant grants funding um, from big trusts and foundations, which allowed us to expand quite a lot. Um, so our team has, has doubled over the last year. Um, and so I think, you know, this, this also speaks to how our message has reached out into new audiences, that, that uh, well-established trust and foundations are becoming increasingly interested in serious economic reform um, and in reform of the monetary system in particular. I'm not going to read these out, but here are some, some quotes from some uh, important people uh, about us, um, politicians and economists, some of our funders, uh, and uh, politicians as well. So that's where we've been and what we've been doing over the last um, eight years or so. Now I want to turn to looking ahead and seeing where we are going and what, what our strategic thinking is for the next two to five years. Um, I mean, but I would just say that I think, you know, as someone new to positive money, um, I'm astonished by how much it's achieved in the, in the seven years that it's been in existence. Um, and I think you know, it's got a great future ahead of it. So we don't see that much has changed in short. And we think there's still a major need for deep structural reform of the economy. Uh, and a huge part of that is reform of money and banking. Now, there's a lovely diagram for you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's clear as mud, so I don't need to explain it. Um, it's very important, I think, to, to situate reform of money and banking within the wider uh, economic reform movement, um, which itself sits within a much broader set of actors. Um, so the sort of theory of change here this is basically a diagram produced by some former colleagues of mine at the IPBR trying to uh, map out the broader economic reform movement. So we're not, you know, we're not the only game in town. There's other actors working on all sorts of things, um, like reform of economics education, um, reform of corporate governance, um, trying to push industrial strategy into the political mainstream. Um, and so we kind of see ourselves, Positive Money, uh, as here. This is in the sort of block of think tanks coupled with the block of campaigning organizations. That's basically what we are. Uh, and we're sort of an outsider organization. We're not really part of the establishment. Um, 
the, the flow of this diagram is that there are, it, it basically describes a theory of change, that there are ideas that grow out of academic institutions, there's communication and debate that happens across social media, the mainstream media, uh, amongst thought leaders and think tanks and the alternative media, uh, and then there's campaigning and coalition building that is done by businesses, uh, civil society organizations, campaigning organizations, which then moves into public policy uh, through political parties and parliament, um, governments, national and, and, and subnational. Um, and that results in institutional behavior in, in, the, in the financial sector, in businesses, in public institutions and in civil society, which determines the sort of economy and society that we have. Um, so it's important to think about where you sit in a sort of broader network of, of actors uh, if you're going to seek to go about uh, achieving change. So, in amongst all of those people, um, what makes positive money unique? What makes us different? Um, so first of all, I think we're the only uh, NGO or think tank in the UK at least that has a specific focus on money and banking. Um, so we have expertise and proposals on central banking, on payment systems and credit allocation. Um, we, uh, we're doing work on emerging issues like digital cash and greener central banks. Um, and we're trying to spearhead an international movement of actors that focus on monetary reform. The second way I think that we're quite different is that we combine the activities of a, a think tank and a campaigning NGO. So most think tanks, including the one I've worked in before, have quite an elite model of influence. They, they come up with their ideas, uh, they throw a report at Westminster and they see if it sticks. They basically try to get into the corridors of power and influence politicians to, to um, affect change. Similarly, a lot of campaigning NGOs tend to adopt the opposite model. They have a huge grassroots network uh, and a, a very amplified voice, but they often reach a bit of a glass ceiling in trying to, to put their ideas uh, in amongst kind of elite decision makers. So we try to do both. We try to have a sort of um, insider, outsider, or top level and bottom level strategy, um, because we think that's more effective, um, that if you can get these things to meet in the middle, then that's where you can achieve uh, change. And as part of that, we adopt different communication styles. So we work on a very complicated issue, but we try to um, put it into a more um, populist language and a more understandable and, and easier to communicate um, discourse. And lastly, we work uh, on systemic thinking. So, uh, you know, some organizations work on quite niche areas that you could separate out more easily from other aspects of the, of the economy and of politics. Um, we work on something which is fundamentally networked within our political economy. So it's complicated, it's very big, uh, it's a system change, and we kind of embrace that complexity and are comfortable with what we don't know, and the fact that there's a lot that we uh, are still uh, endeavouring to understand uh, and to learn from. So having thought about um, the, the world that we're in and the network of actors that we uh, operate within, and what makes us different, what is our theory of change? How do we seek to achieve change in the money and banking system? Um, so we effectively have four programs of work. Um, we want to build a movement for reform, uh, a community of change makers um, involving public experts and influencers. And there's four programs through which we do this. Um, firstly, we have a research program. So we research the problems with the money and banking system to try and develop proposals to reform it and, and win the support of economists. Uh, we try to build a growing and diverse support network which works with us. Uh, we seek to influence decision makers um, in the UK, uh, in, in Westminster and in the Treasury. Um, and we try to lead uh, an international movement advocating reform around the world. So those are our four active programs of work uh, within the organization. Um, and then they work together in some specific ways. So the research and influencing programs, they work together to create policy proposals, so things that the government actors could, could put into place, um, uh, and to get support for them amongst uh, economists. Using the uh, arguments and evidence that are produced by the research uh, program, um, our support network aims to educate, inform, and mobilize uh, the public. And we do this by producing content, um, smart content, ideally. Um, communications like short videos, blogs, uh, and social media posts, uh, and connecting people around the country in a, in a network of local groups. And then also the influencing program, 
um, works with the, our people-powered supporter network um, on campaigns. Um, so we, we seize opportunities, we're quite reactive in, into the political weather, to push our, our campaigns into uh, public discourse and try to shift policymakers' views um, on the problems with money and banking. And then lastly, we believe that to create systemic change, uh, that can only occur if there's a global debate on these issues. So all of that is also pushing out into a wider global network and through the new um, presences that we try to set up uh, in Europe uh, and the US. So what are we trying to achieve with each of these programs? Um, some immediate things on our horizon, things coming up in the next uh, few months. Um, we're releasing a paper on a greener Bank of England and building sustainability into its mandate. Um, we're planning a local group leaders day uh, to share knowledge and, and uh, think about the strategy for our local groups over the next year. Um, and we want to capitalize on the uh, 10 years after the crash anniversary in September uh, with quite a big populist campaign to generate a lot of media attention. Um, I won't want to run through all of these. Um, but in short, you know, we want research proposals to influence economists. We want to grow and diversify a supporter network. Uh, we want to develop policy positions that uh, influencers can put into place uh, and be a leading commentator in the media uh, and grow our international presence. And then lastly, I thought I'd run through some of our policy change proposals, the things that we would like to see happen. So ultimately, we, we believe that reforming the money and banking system relies on a series of policy changes. And the key decision makers and, uh, who, can, who can affect these changes are the governor of the Bank of England and the chancellor of the Exchequer. And these individuals are themselves uh, influenced by a range of stakeholders, their advisors, uh, high-profile economists, the media, and public opinion. So we seek to influence all of those to influence them. Uh, so I'll quickly run through these with the caveat that I'm not an economist, so uh, please bear with me if I don't have an expert understanding of some of these things. Um, firstly, we want to push for sovereign money creation, uh, or QE for the people. Um, so the biggest monetary policy experiment um, of the last 50 years has been quantitative easing the creation of £445 billion uh, into financial markets. Um, so we think that a lot of this money could be used more constructively into, in green projects, uh, in investment, creating jobs uh, and raising wages, uh, and helping us to invest in um, renewable energy and, and to support a low carbon transition. Secondly, we'd like to see central banks be able to issue digital cash. Um, so that is, uh, Obviously, all, mo most money these days is electronic, um, but it's created by private banks. We would like central banks to have the same uh, ability for you to have a, a bank account there, uh, in the same way you do at a private bank. Um, we don't, this is not an attempt to abolish physical cash, but to add uh, digital cash as a, as, a rep as a tool in the Bank of England's um, tool case. Um, this would mean that the payment system is protected from uh, private banks' um, riskier and, and more dangerous lending. Um, and we think that you know, the ability to participate in a payment system is, is just crucial to people's uh, engagement in the economy. We want to see institutional reform of the Bank of England such that it works uh, more closely with government um, on uh, a more beneficial macroeconomic policy. We'd like to see the Bank of England add sustainability to its mandate. Um, so a lot of things that the Bank of England does uh, either doesn't help or is detrimental towards climate change. Um, so uh, uh, the Bank of England's monetary policy currently allows, um, through quantitative easing, the purchase of fossil fuel bonds. Um, so we'd like sustainability to be built into um, the Bank of England's mandate. Uh, and coupled with that is, is ending corporate quantitative easing. We'd also like the Treasury to review its appointment process um, for senior bank officials, uh, members of the monetary policy community, um, because the Bank of England is, represents a, a very uh, niche group of interests, and we'd like to see that uh, diversified. Um, we'd also like to see increased diversity in the banking system generally, so not just diversity of people, but diversity of, of models of banks. Um, and and lastly, we'd like to see a full-blown sovereign money system. Um, so this would be a system where the uh, ability to create money was removed from private interests of commercial banks uh, and held exclusively um, by a central bank. 
Um, I think it's worth flagging that I'm aware there's been quite a lot of concern uh, amongst our supporters um, that, uh, uh, sovereign, that somehow we're moving away from a sovereign, that advocating a sovereign money system uh, or that we're no longer working on it. So I just want to assure you that that's definitely not the case. Um, we currently have a researcher, Constantin, who's uh, focused on, uh, sovereign, the, on researching sovereign money creation and a sovereign money system specifically. Um, we're looking at reissuing modernizing money, um, the, the book, uh, our founding book by Ben Dyson, um, to update it as it's uh, now eight years old. Uh, and we're developing a separate website, um, bringing together key thinkers on sovereign money uh, and building a network of advocates for it. I think the main difference with our research agenda and our strategy now um, is that we're working on a broader range of issues around monetary policy in addition to sovereign money. Um, and the, the reason for this is that a sovereign money system, a full sovereign money system, would be a momentous shift. Um, and it's not going to happen uh, overnight without incremental changes in other areas of monetary policy reform. Um, as, because these open the door for more radical thinking. Um, I think if we, if we only advocate for a sovereign money system, we're going to come up against closed doors. I think change happens when um, influential opinion gradually shifts uh, at the top and when there's simultaneously growing pressure coming from uh, the grassroots. So a broader range of research areas means that we can bring um, more people into our campaign um, through more populist campaigns. Uh, we can appeal to a greater range of people uh, and we can, find, we can find more immediate and short-term routes to change along the way to a sovereign money system. Some of you may have heard of the concept of the uh, Overton window, uh, named for James Joseph Overton, who was a vice president at the Policy Institute in America. So he described the Overton window as the sort of um, the window of what is politically acceptable, viable. Um, that it depends less on um, politicians' individual views of a political idea, um, or on the merit of the idea, and more on the um, uh, acceptability within popular discourse, within popular opinion. Um, you often hear politicians say things like, there is no alternative, uh, it's the way it is. You will have heard Theresa May talk about how there is no magic money tree. Um, and that's because politicians, I think, generally operate within the Overton window, window of things which are conventionally seen to be popular uh, and sensible. Um, I think so a sovereign money system is currently more at the radical, unthinkable end um, of, of, uh, of, uh, of popular understanding of policy measures. Um, there's more mainstream interest than ever before, you know, there's people like Martin Wolf in the Financial Times who've written about it, but there's still no major political party in the world, um, as far as I know, that advocates it, and an austerity narrative has, has taken hold over the last um, eight years. But we can shift this window um, by uh, advocating things that are closer to the sort of middle part. So digital cash, for instance, is more in the sort of popular, sensible um, bit of the window. Um, if you get influential people and economists and the media and politicians to advocate that, then you encourage, and you encourage change around the world, then that drags the edges of the window uh, in our direction. It's then a smaller leap to advocate um, for sovereign money creation um, or QE for the people. Um, and then it's a smaller leap again to advocate a sovereign money system for the, for the Bank of England to have the exclusive right to create money. And as such, something that's radical and unthinkable starts to seem uh, more acceptable, more sensible, eventually more popular, and then can finally become policy. Um, most important political ideas, I think, start at the, the edges of this, and they get through dogged determination and campaigning, they get dragged more towards the middle. Um, as an example, I, I point to childcare. Um, so 30, 40 years ago, childcare was very much considered a, a private matter, not something for the state to get involved in. Uh, and through steady work, campaigners have ensured that in the last election, every um, major political party had an offer on childcare, a sort of state-based um, uh, uh, policy on childcare that would simply have not been conceivable um, 30, 40 years before. Also, this also explains, I think, how dangerous and damaging things can get into the mainstream. You can consider how things said by Donald Trump, which would have been unthinkable um, for a president to say years ago, are now starting to become normalised. Um, because it, it's hard for people to maintain their levels of, of shock. Um, so this can work in a positive or, or a negative way. So that's a very quick run through our sort of strategic thinking for the next two to three years. Where we are, where we see ourselves situated, um, and where we think we are going with our agenda. Um, 
I'll leave you with this picture. This is my daughter, Audrey, who's the latest member of Positive Money. <laughs> <laughs> At age three, she's already a budding economist. <laughs> Above all, we, we believe in the power of systemic change. We think that big systemic changes uh, to the money and banking system will allow us to tackle uh, many of the major problems that we face in our society and in the environment uh, and in our political system. And we believe, that we believe in those things because they will allow people to have better lives, fundamentally. You know, to have affordable homes, to have more secure jobs, uh, and to have less debt. So that's what it's all about uh, at the end. So thank you. Um, and now, over to you. I've only been here for seven months, um, and many of you have been involved for many, many years. So I'm very keen to hear what you think about positive money and where it's going and its strategic direction. So what I'd suggest now, before we get into a Q&A, uh, is for you to maybe gather into groups of two or three and have a quick um, five-minute discussion with your neighbour. Um, and here are some prompts for your discussion. What are you most excited about? What are the opportunities and challenges that you think positive money faces? Uh, what do you think is missing from what I've just said? Uh, what do you think is the best way for us to communicate our ideas and, and reach new audiences? Um, so if I could ask you to, to have a discussion for about five minutes and then we'll come back and have a bit of Q&A. Okay, shall we now open up and start the discussion? Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's start asking questions and uh, some of the discussions we've been having now. Share those. Who would like to start? Yep. Paul, oh, I was quite interested in uh, the um, digital cash uh, proposal because I, I have some concerns. Although I did sign a petition in favour of it because positive money doesn't want to do away with physical cash, but I think there are dangers lurking behind it because uh, the debt levels across Western nations now are so chronic that uh, uh, what most governments would want to do if there's any chaos is to actually uh, um, yeah, impose financial repression and negative interest rates so they'll compel everybody to spend money and, and try and get, keep the economy going for just a little while longer. But so uh, I think there are dangers in, uh, you know, if we go down to Sweden, I think Sweden have gone down that line, and I think uh, to a substantial extent they're starting to regress it. Yeah, I think um, with, with digital cash, the, the proposal is, is, is less a sort of, uh, it's not a replacement for current bank accounts, it's to add the option that as well as going to Barclays, NatWest, HSBC for a bank account, you could also have a bank account at the, the Bank of England. Um, so that they, they'd, have the, they'd have the power that currently only commercial banks get to have to create um, uh, money uh, for people's deposits within the Bank of England, um, uh, rather than just creating cash, which is what the Bank of England does at the moment. Um, so I think the, the, the danger is limited in, insofar as it's an addition to that current system, rather than a sort of full-blown switch. Um, you know, I think it's always dangerous with any policy proposal to just you know, flick the switch and go completely from one system to to another. Yeah, I, I think you know, this, what positive money has, has done is, is fantastic in terms of raising the awareness, and that, that is crucial and uh, fantastic work. I think what it's missing is potentially look at local banking mm. and how that can influence things, because I think it's all been about central banks and central bank <laughs> sort of proposals, but actually maybe doing some analysis and, and research on local banking and how that can have a positive impact if it's structured correctly. Hmm. The RSA is doing that, isn't it? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, it's not something we've looked at before simply because the, the, the sort of the origins of the organisation began with kind of the big sort of central bank questions and commercial bank questions, and we kind of. Uh, we've grown along that path. Um, and broadly, we're in favour of a more diverse range of banks, um, but it's not something that we've, we've specifically looked at. Um, but I think you know, there's, gro there's growing interest in, in kind of amongst funders of, of different ways that the banking system could operate, and I think there could definitely be room for us to work on that in the future. Um, well, what will happen to banks when the, the ability to lend and produce money is taken away? I mean, what will happen to commercial banks? Will they have any real function? 
So I think they'd have a diminished function, but I think they'd, they'd, they'd largely do what I think um, in popular understanding people assume they do at the moment, which is that they, they continue to make loans and provide credit, but, with, um, uh, but without the ability to, 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 to simply create um, money for those loans. They'd be, lo they'd be making loans on the basis of their own uh, levels of capital and assets, rather than with relative unlimited freedom to, to make loans. The only sort of limitation on a bank's ability to make loans is their own um, uh, assessment of the likelihood of them being repaid. Um, so I think there'd still be an extremely important role for commercial banks, but their sort of their power and their influence on the way uh, economy and debt levels uh, increase would be would be curtailed. I'm no, afraid we three didn't get very much further than the height of one, okay. um, and we said we we're going to be quite excited about the prospect of uh, cheaper houses and more wages, better wages for poorer people and so on. But I think, at least I, I certainly, I'm not trying to speak with the other two, find the link between producing the sovereign money and the next step, which is everything else mm. all good coming out of it. I find that an act of faith that I don't find quite as easy to accept as some people do. I mean, you see, there's lots of economists who have really good ideas. We do need to alter the system. But no one quite agrees that, I mean, if we say I'm better, we would not agree with positive money. She thinks we need to do it a different way. And I, I don't know. I just find it very confusing. But economics is very confusing. Anyway. I think what I would say is, is missing for, for, for me is um, something like a roadmap. Mm. I th it's a great presentation, by the way. It's great okay. for me on, on what possible money is about. Um, and great to have that update. But I do worry about the digital cash issue, for example, that it, at worst it could be a red herring. I understand the logic about the Overton window, and that's a good explanation you gave there, but um, there are a lot of uh, suspicions about just the very concept of digital cash and the impression idea and so on, to read on the internet around that. Um, so I think I'd like to see, I am very excited about positive money's uh, inroads that, that you've made with, with connecting with uh, influential people and so on. I think that's, so it looks like a lot of progress to me. Um, but I, I would really like to see, I think the time is right for positive money to come up, and I've said this to Fran Boat before, uh, uh, something equivalent to a roadmap, something more specific. Mm. I, I don't disagree with the general sort of pincer movement. You didn't use that expression. You looked, it sounded a bit like yeah. pincer movement, which, is, which is, sounds like a good idea. But I think some, something more specific like a roadmap would, would make me feel a lot more confident. I, I, I just mentioned in passing that um, when uh, Positive Money put out this news about the the European spread of, of you know, the other organisations. So I, I did get very excited about that uh, news. And I, I've been following for some time Jim Sinclair, which is some, some of you will know about being quite big in the gold world for decades. Um, so I took the opportunity of email again and uh, said, you know, what do you think about this news and, and prospects? And it is, sadly he gave a four-word answer, which it will never happen. So I, I, you know, I can, I can only share that, um, I, you know, acknowledge that scepticism, and, and so I think something more specific like a roadmap will be helpful. But isn't that sort of part of the, the vision of unthinkable, radical? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why I could, could suggest yeah. that we should have a diversity of banking. We should concentrate on the diversity of banking to give the existing banks more competition. Rather than trying to blow them out of the water and saying you're going to give it all the mm -hmm. give it all the Bank of England, which is immediately going to get their backs up, it's much more subtle in inverted commas to try and get lots of different banks, which will force the big banks to change the way they do business, it will not and also centralising everything in the Bank of England. To me, is not a good idea. We're centralising again in the hands of you know an elite few. We were wondering about um, levels of resistance and parties, resistant parties. I did wonder whether you've gone through a sort of stakeholder analysis to, to look at that in, in depth. Should we, on those sort of, rather than coming back and everything, on those sort of issues of um, a roadmap for change, um, the European venture, and its implausibility, um, a more diverse banking sector, uh, and, and levels of, of resistance. Has anybody else got comments or questions related to those things they'd like to chip in? Yeah, um, I mean, firstly, I, I sort of this. I, I would say that simply allowing private banks, commercial banks, to 
compete more widely with each other in creating money as debt is not in, in any way an answer. Um, and that the one, the one thing that is actually positive money to USP, the lodestone, is that there is, there is a proposal which will, which will solve, or at least sort of do a great deal to, to, to solve the existing state of affairs. And that is something that nobody else has come up, come up with. So I think the, ro the roadmap's a, a very good idea because it, it, it doesn't sort of necessarily assume that it's got to be kind of, you know, onto the financial barricades and sort of, you know, and, and revolution, but it does, it does make sure that we're focused on where we're going. Otherwise, I, th I think sort of digital, digital cash by itself is kind of, it's a, it, it would, wouldn't do any harm, but it wouldn't actually, it wouldn't actually do a great deal, really. And I think it could easily, it's a dilution if we don't know where we're going. Just really, just to add on to the, the comment about points of resistance, I just wonder who, who are the biggest losers from a transition? In the current system to positive money because I mean, they're obviously going to be points of resistance, but who is going to lose most? Shall I have a go at something? Um, on the Roma, so you're exactly right. I mean, like, uh, I would love to spell out my sort of clear series of, um, of landmarks along the route to um, everything that we, that we want in the world. I guess. We try to do that with our, with our theory of change and the way that we describe our sort of situation in the world. Um, I think one of the difficulties is, is, is just the level of complexity of the sort of um, system that we're trying to, to overturn and the, the amount of actors that exist within it and the, the effect that things that we can't control has on what that roadmap would look like. So, you know, the effect of a, of a financial crash um, or the effect of um, significant changes in political leadership and, and political agendas. Um, you know the effects of of, of uh, environmental catastrophe and, and 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 instability around the world. There's so many things that could suddenly pop this this issue into the limelight. Or equally, kind of, you know, if the economy remains sort of stable, we take along, we you know, we avoid a crash for another 10, 20 years. It can keep it very repressed. Um, alternatively, there is there is another financial crash. It might kind of burst into the mainstream. Um, so I think like we, we can we can we can map out our sort of route to change up to a point, kind of into the sort of near to mid-term, but then there's kind of, uh, we, we kind of reach a, a, a number of branches in the potential, a number of potential forks in the road that we kind of can't um, envision. Um, but, it is, but it is very important. I think no organization can really say that it knows what it's trying to do without some sense of theory of change. And I, and I do think it's something that we can definitely develop and, and, and make a bit more fine-grained uh, as we go. Um, Apologies if I miss things. Um, it, on the, the, the diversity of, of, of banking thing, I think that I think that definitely would um, uh, be a benefit. And we, we, we're very open to a, a diverse, a more diverse range of actors in the banking sector. One of the main problems in the banking sector is that it's, it's largely a closed shop. You know, there are a few major players. It's very hard to open some kind of challenger bank, even on the on the conventional system without changing any of the sort of fundamentals. It's just very hard to do that. Um, and so I do think like some increased competition would, would certainly be of benefit. I just I also think that it would only take you so far, and that the sort of the, the deeper structural problems in the way money is created would, unless they are addressed as well, um, uh, you know, we did we'd achieve uh, marginal benefits, but without substantial benefit to overturn some of the, the really um, in deep, come deeply raised. The banks, the banks, major lobbyists. Oh, of course, God yes. So, so who are the biggest? Who are the biggest losers? Undermine them. Okay. I mean, the biggest losers of, of these sorts of changes would be, would be the financial sector. So the financial sector, particularly in this country, is enormously powerful, enormous amounts of money. Uh, I, you know, I used to work for a mainstream think tank. They're always at our door kind of wanting to sponsor events and, and, and you know, basically offering cash for access. That's what, that's what they want. That's how lobbying works. You know, they want to kind of find their way into kind of uh, rooms with, with influential people and, and, and maintain that Overton window in the same place that it is now. Um, and you know it's, it's certainly very hard to to overcome that. Um, I think the only way you can overcome that level of power and resource is with um, well, as with this pincer movement of this pressure from from the grassroots, um, and also kind of change in the minds of of, of uh, politicians who ultimately serve voters um, rather than um, shareholders. Um, you know, say what you like about politicians, there's a hell of a lot of corruption. There's a hell of a lot who aren't very good, um, but structurally the system. They are there because of what voters want them to be there for. And so if you change voters' minds, they will follow suit. 
Um, so I think that's the, the only sort of way around the enormous power of, of, of the banking lobby. Paul, oh, can I make a couple of... Sorry, please, yeah. you carry on, Tom. No, if I'm on any subject that you want to jump in on, don't like, let's not just keep going back and forth, just please jump in. Yeah, I was going to say, say uh, about the, uh, the banks. There used to be a very clear message from Positive Money that the banks created our money, these were the problems, and the solution was to stop the banks creating money. Mm. And now you seem to have retreated from that and gone into your shell and done a lot of research to see where we're going next. Mm. And, and you seem to have emasculated uh, the, the organisation because there's no clear proposal of what you want to do, is, is my impression. I mean, you, you do say you want sovereign money at the end, but it's not the top of the list. And it should be the top of the list yeah, if, you want the to, end game, yeah. if you want to stop the unfair arrangement of private banks creating money. And the, the other point I'd like to make is that the Green Party have vast, uh, long, detailed uh, policies. And the economic policy runs to about 30 pages of A4. Mm -hmm. But in that, there is a proposal to stop banks creating money. You'd never know it, would you? It's very much in the small print. <laughs> it is, yes. But, but it shouldn't be. I mean, they're, no, not, they're definitely not to right. right. But uh, that's it. So I think, in a way, Positive Money has made a mistake by not uh, pushing or by trying to keep separate from political parties. The only way you're going to change it is for a political party to change it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So people like to comment on this while we're on yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been a member of this group for some time. Very interesting simulating coming to these meetings. If you ask me, what have I done locally? The answer is, apart from manning a stall on the Cathedral Green, not very much, apart from three of us getting um, trying to get together with the local MP. Now, I've said this before to this meeting, but Ben Bradshaw, MP for Exeter, told me that, and I use his words, he doesn't know anything about the financial system. This is the person who's supposed to be representing us mm -hmm. against these vested interests. But he would not meet with us. He, not only does he admit he doesn't know about the financial system, he doesn't want to know about the financial system. Mm -hmm. He's probably one of these very large number of MPs who think that money is created by the state. Mm -hmm. He hasn't even got to square number one in thinking about these issues. So as far as your model is concerned, on the one hand, you, you say we want, to inf we want to influence these influential people, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And you also say you want these local campaigning groups to campaign, to support. It's actually quite difficult for a number of reasons for us to do that. Unless we can be given the power by you or the means, whether it's a, 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 some process or some education pack for MPs or putting them on the spot, mm -hmm. so they cannot get away with it. Yeah, yeah. They cannot get away with this inertia of convention in which politics proceeds through ignorance. And I'd like you to go back and think of ways in which we can ensure that this man has to listen and to ensure that other MPs, who are equally ignorant, have to listen. Because what you're doing then is bringing together the power of a local group, the constituents, mm -hmm. with somebody who, in theory, should have power himself. Mm -hmm. So your two modes of campaigning are brought together. So I, I mean, I, and I'm involved in other political issues. I don't have an awful lot of time for positive money. But I want to spend my time wisely. I would love to get Bradshaw on the spot with the intelligent people in this room and to wake the man up a bit. And this should be done all over the country, yeah. But, but isn't it an idea to use our political calendar? I mean, we've got the May elections that becomes important. Politics suddenly becomes important. If you invite one person to have a forum to speak and invite another person with another political party, they will be concerned that somebody will, will turn up and they won't be there. So if you, if you kind of yeah. use, not, not the, the May elections for one particular party, but as a political 
calendar, part of the political calendar, which you must start to, to, to have groups that talk in a cross political way to people like Ben Bradshaw, who want to be there then, if others are. There's something else I think we need to do is to lock that revolving door. Um, <laughs> I should, I, I should have, through my career, I've seen some of these things. But um, people move in and out of, of Parliament and uh, institutions. Um, I mean, I, I, I sat around British uh, standard for issue policy meetings. And, uh, you know, people float from the best of interest of the, yeah. the, the manufacturers to the, you know, it, it just. Who's got more influence, the banks and, and the people with the big bribes, or the, us, the electorate? The, um, people <laughs> think the banks have got the biggest bribes of everyone. It is, it is uh, out, uh, outrageous that um, members of parliament who are, um, for all intents and purposes, representing the interests of their, their constituents, um, do not know, are ignorant largely uh, of the way money works. And yet, at the mercy of lobbyists right. with festive interests. Well, while we're on the subject of how we pin MPs down and how we kind of um, force them to open their eyes and see the, the nature of the system, do, do other people have ideas that they'd like to contribute by that? Well, Paul, while well, on the subject of what's missing and, and the pin Can we know, can we answer his question first? Not a, not a new question. Are you answering it? No, not directly. Come, come back to it. Who, who yeah, wants please. to answer his question? How should we influence, how should they help us influence MPs? This is, this is a, going back to what you were talking about, an educational tool. If we have an educational tool for MPs, it should also be accessible for us. Because I think we do, some of us are rather passionate about this. And yet, I, I, I can only speak for myself, I struggle to communicate clearly. Um, I think part, uh, I mean, I've got the Modernising Money book. I, I've read the majority of it. And I, I can come up with bits, but it's not a very complete vision that I have. And my dad, I, I got my dad to read the book, and he, he said, he, there's not a good enough framework for his understanding, as it were. And so, if we can improve our understanding, and that's where I think positive money should invest in an educational tool. You get so many online courses, mm -hmm. and you can create an online course quite freely, and, or at least cheaply. You just need someone to invest uh, in that. It's not about having videos, it's about getting people to engage with the subject properly. So you ask the people questions, and you give them maybe multiple choice questions, and you say why you think it's this and not these other two. Um, so it's not about just giving the information, it's also about discussing that information. Mm. And that's part of where a lot of these positive money videos fail, because they say, this person said this, they're actually wrong, this is what happened. Yeah. I think we can have more educational tools on that front, and I think that would help mobilise us, and therefore we would have more impact with our friends, and, uh, and sort of a knock-on effect on the MPs as well, who if they want to. So the guy to your right, it's yeah. on an economics course, so I really, uh, uh, yeah. really like to hear what you think. Yeah, so I think links that in terms of, I think, the sort of making it part of educating people in general, because as you've as been brought up lots of times, MPs don't understand the system better than other people, so there's no reason why, as you were saying, it's a bit it needs to be set at a different level, that it can't also be really useful for um, getting everyone else to understand. And there was a specific question of how to reach people like MPs, I would suggest sort of less formal channels, mm. um, because they don't cover a huge area, there's always going to be someone's niece that does work experience in his office or you know the local councillors in particular or even candidates for it cover a relatively small area mm. there will be you know then there, there can't be that many people who are more than two steps away that the, there must be less formal channels where you can approach for ben Bradshaw as an example through somebody that you know or somebody you know through a couple of steps and i think those less formal approaches 
um, at least more personal approaches and work better than sort of cold emailing, essentially, mm -hmm. cold calling. Um, and it, it feels less of a, an attack of, you don't understand this, we're yeah. going to make you understand this. Because it's, you know, get, you know, uh, one of the, you know, candidates for local council to come down and become part of the group. And I think, I, hopefully everyone else, but I know sort of I found it's certainly very inspiring. And yeah, sort of, you know, people talk about it a lot and you hear about it a lot. And when, when people become part of this group, or uh, any positive money group, or anything around the reform, and you see how important it is, I think that less formal channel of, of getting something, even just, you know, uh, a candidate councillor within Labour, given right, their actual CMP at the moment, mm -hmm. um, to come down, say, to this group, or, you know, those, those sort of less formal channels, I think, um, are a better way of reaching MPs. Um, but on the education stuff, I completely agree. There's no reason why it needs to be set at a different level for them than for anyone else, so it could be useful. Yeah. So what's at, the last, at the last parliamentary uh, launch of the, it was the sustainable economy thing I was at in, uh, in Parliament House or whatever it's called, and Friends of the Earth guy was saying what they did last time at the new election, they had a course for new MPs. You're not going to get the old ones. Mm -hmm. And he said it's surprising how the young ones came and they now talk the talk sustainability and so forth. So I think that would be a good one for us to do for the next election. And it could be also good enough, if it's good enough for them, it would be good enough for us as well. Yeah. yeah. So I think a course at that level would be uh, yeah. Maybe it's a case for a mandatory qualification for one of the uh, politicians. After all, most of us, <laughs> most of us are professional in our own field. We <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get to drive a car. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, a Republican rather than a Monica. Do we, do we have to have a member of the Windsor family? Shall I have a go at some of these? Yeah, yeah, that'd be mean, great. To what extent does the monarchy have any, <laughs> any, any central control of the money? I mean, the other thing is, that I'd like to say is that quantitative easing is a mystery to nearly, uh, what, Two thirds of the members of parliament, I would think. It's not a bit of a mystery to me, to be honest. Is it? Yeah. So, Paul, so I mean, yes, answer, would you help? Sure. sure. So, so, I mean, just, just on that, firstly, that, so we don't mean by sovereign money the, the sort of monarch sovereign. We mean sovereign in the sense of, of kind of where power ultimately lies. So, in this country, parliament is, is sovereign, the Queen's yeah. the figurehead. Um, so we mean we mean um, sovereign money, a sovereign money system in the sense that sovereign power to create it resides within um, parliament or its agents, such that there could be a, a monetary creation committee, for instance, that has power to create, um, but that would have to be separated from um, uh, the power to spend because you very easily have uh, uh, a clash of interests. Um, so we don't mean sovereign like monarch; we mean sovereign in the sense of public power. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, on the, quest, on the first question from about um, the sort of how so you think a sovereign money system has been sort of hidden away, um, I'll, I'll grant you that I think in the way that we've become uh, a bit more diverse on our research agenda, we've, 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 we've allowed that to slip slightly from the sort of front and centre aspect of our communications, and I think that was a mistake. Um, I guess I just reassure you that that's, that's not at the bottom of that list because it's the least important, it's the most important. Um, it's at the bottom insofar as it's the most difficult thing to get to, and it requires other changes along the way. Um, but it's the kind of end goal. Um, it's the ultimate expression of a solution to this problem. Um, it's just that it's, it, if, we were to, if we only talk about that, we, we will have uh, fewer routes into influence that would ultimately lead towards it. So we have to talk about other things, which are, which are valuable in their own right, um, I do think, but in order to get to that um, end goal as well. Um, did you want to come in on this particular yeah, question? Yeah. And then so, I'll come on to this MPs thing. Yeah, so um, I think the, the scope has certainly become broader and broader over time. And I think some of that, I completely agree, all of them were worthwhile in their <coughs> Most of them can be seen as like a progression towards sort of money in terms of queuing of people, digital capital, those kind of things. The one thing that I didn't really see how it fitted in with that was the sustainability side of things. 
So I completely agree it's very worthwhile, um, but to me it's almost the other way around. So for everything else, it helps you get to a fairer, more equal system. And then the environmental stuff is something more like something you could achieve if you had that. So everything else, say digital cash for few people, I can see how that gets you closer to um, a sort of sovereign money world. I don't see how the sustainable stuff does. I see that it's linked, but I see it as more as beyond rather than before. Yeah. I think that having a more uh, a, a system that's aiming to be environmentally friendly, for example. I guess the sort of prerequisite for that is thinking that the current monetary system is a, is a, is a sort of cause of environmental unsustainability. So making environmental sustainability part of the Bank of England's mandate sort of um, makes it intrinsic that they have to think about the sorts of things that we're uh, proposing. But I'll grant you that it, it, it could seem uh, a, a potential distraction. Um, and then to come back to this question about uh, uh, MPs and how do we pin them down, why don't they understand? Um, I, mean, I, have a, I have a slight sympathy for MPs insofar as everybody who meets them wants them to understand their particular issue and they can't possibly understand all of them. Um, I think ultimately what it comes down to with, with MPs is that they are, they are reactive creatures that serve, um, they serve a political system. Uh, and the, the things that they will get most excited about and put their most energy into and, and try to understand and try to change are the things where they see the votes and where they see um, popular opinion. And that's why I think that the, the movement is so important, because the more people that understand this stuff, the more people that are pushing for it, whether they fully understand it, I, you know, I think a real, a real thing to avoid with this entire subject is thinking, I don't understand it well enough, so I can't kind of communicate it. I can't, your kind of point before, that I can't kind of um, sum it up well enough to be able to sort of push for it. I think that's kind of the problem of economics in general, that, it's, it, that it has a deliberate barrier to understanding. There is a jargon, there is a priesthood, it's a modern priesthood that exists to sort of mediate your relationship with the god capital. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's deliberately obstructive. So I, I, would, I would always just push back on the sense that I don't understand it enough to, to talk about it. Um, and that's why I think, you know, if people are simply pushing for more, more investment in houses, more investment in um, uh, schools, more investment in health, whatever it is that, that we want. And by the way, a way you could do that is overt monetary financing, using the power of quantitative easing, which is the creation of money by central banks, which currently has only been put into financial markets to bail out banks, that we could put that into productive things. So a simple, a simple route into the subject is, you know, uh, the NHS has fallen apart, we need money for it, let's create it and invest it into something which over the long term will be beneficial economically, societally, um, and morally for the nation. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that quite, it's quite right, it seems to me. To be sure, MPs are very, very busy. They have all sorts of things to deal with, and you can't blame them for not knowing about most of the issues. That's absolutely right. And it points to a structural problem we have in our parliamentary democracy. It is a structural problem. Um, because these are the people who are representing us against these huge vested interests. But if you, won't, you won't get Ben Bradshaw or anybody other MP saying, well, I better listen to positive money because there is in my constituency a groundswell of opinion in favour of positive money. Mm. It doesn't work like that. I, I'm acting on other issues, uh, which again, there's never going to, I work, on, I work on behalf of the Palestinians, for example. You'll never get a groundswell of opinion in any constituency in this country in favour of taking action on behalf of the Palestinians. You just won't. Mm -hmm. However, I and others have met with Bradshaw, we've informed him of the issue, he did listen on that, it was some time ago, and it made a real difference. So people who know about issues, meeting with MPs, quite irrespective of the electoral appeal of it, and talking to them, informing them in a friendly, non-arrogant, tactful way, mm. is absolutely vital part of our parliamentary democracy. If that doesn't happen, then we're lost. And it should never just be a matter of expecting 100,000 people in Exeter to pressure Bradshaw. And so it really does make a difference to whether it's informal or formal, whether it's by putting motions in political parties, whether it's pressure from the centre, all sorts of ways it could be done. It, unless we actually have these conversations with the people who are supposed to be representing us, then we're not going to achieve anything. You can't just sit back and wait for the people of Exeter to demand 
that positive money get a hearing. Mm. I completely agree with that. Um, do you want to come in on the same? Uh, yes, somebody who hasn't mentioned talk yet. I wouldn't feel sorry for MPs. Um, <laughs> I've met about a dozen MPs from the South West region talking to them about the National Health Service, and with two exceptions, most of them haven't got the faintest idea yeah. about funding of the National Health Service or the running of the National Health Service or the threats that Brexit will pose to the National Health Service. They don't even know. Uh, and yet they take views on this and they vote on this in the House of Commons. They, have, they will be voting when, in the way that they are whipped to, to do it. But I would agree with this gentleman here about how, you know, if you really want to shift the Overton window, make your most radical idea your headline. That's how you shift things. I mean, how did we stop slavery? We didn't stop slavery by saying, well, let's, let's restrict the number of slaves that people can have and make them pay them a little bit. They just said it's wrong, it's finished, and it's yeah. got to go. And that's what we should be doing. You know, if we believe that sovereign money and the end of private banking is the is the answer, let's put it right up there, right under the headline. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Uh, a couple of other things that, that, that things we could do possibly to get at the political establishment from both ends. One is that, uh, that we, there's a huge trade union network in this country whose members are in penury as a consequence of the monetary system that is now running. What does penury mean? Poverty. Uh, poverty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think, and they are political, and they will push. Uh, you know, to, at the moment, I see the trade union network as being reactive. <laughs> It's more than high time, they're well overdue to get on the front foot and to strike up liaisons with Positive Money and other like-minded organisations. So that's from the bottom end. From the top end, I think uh, what's missing is a, a, a tighter link with the, the Climate Change Forum. So, you know, talking to people like Professor Anderson and more locally, Nicky Jones. Because obviously the current system is, is promoting growth as a means of dealing with debt. That growth in itself is socially and environmentally destructive. So uh, by creating a link there, then that's the climate change, uh, once it's made the links with the monetary system, will be more influential in uh, getting at the MP. So I think those are two avenues for one at the top and one at the bottom, which may be worthwhile exploring. Okay, I, I just to up. I mean, everybody can become a member of Unite Community, which I am a member of Unite Community, and you can put your point of view about positive money at um, Trade Council or Unite Community meetings. The other thing I'd like to say is that we should actually get into colleges and schools, because when they say we're doing a wonderful job at educating young people, if you ask them, where does the money come from? Who creates the money? Who owns the land around here? Who owns the property? And you start saying, well, who decides who, on, who creates the money on it? And what you'll find is they haven't got a clue on any of those three questions. I think this is something that the youth network is working on by going, not, maybe not schools and colleges, but definitely in universities. Yeah. That's what they're really pushing for. Yeah, I think we but should push it. Further, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, could you just talk about the youth network a little sure. bit more? Because you haven't. Sure. Um, so. So I've, I've said a few times that we, we want to broaden our appeal and reach, reach newer audiences. And I think you know a, a problem that people have touched on is this um, uh, ignorance of politicians and how money is created, and that's a byproduct of education systems that teach a certain form of, of economics, um, classical economics, which often doesn't take this sort of thing into account. Um, so the, there are there are other people, first of all, who are working quite specifically on reform of economics education. Um, there's uh, an organisation called I think it's just called Economy. Um, uh, run by, uh, it was started by a group of students that were just angry about their course because they felt like it didn't explain the world and there'd been a financial crash and it hadn't been taken into account in their coursework and they just set this thing up. Um, our youth network is, is, is a specific endeavour to, to reach into universities with our agenda. So um, it's only just begun, we, we started doing it late last year um, and we've, um, uh, we've kind of established a, a sort of point person in a number of universities around the country, similar to the local group model where there's a local group leader who then tries to coordinate discussions and meetings in a local group. We'd like to kind of replicate that uh, such that there might be a, a sort of monetary reform society in a number of universities um, to the extent that you know, we can get uh, uh, people interested in it. Um, so that is a sort of relatively new venture that we're trying to push over the next few years. Do people have any specific questions on that? 
Can I ask a, a question? Yeah. Um, I think what may be missing, and I'm sure if a revision of the Sovereign Money, Modernising Money book with a roadmap is what is required, it does need updating. And it also needs an extra chapter saying, and if it is in place, this is how it will affect ha homeless and housing and debt and so forth. It needs that extra couple of chapters showing the advantages of, of the, not financial, but all the other things of the economy. I think one of the weaknesses we have in positive money is that we haven't attracted very senior uh, economists. They all talk their own talk, and we haven't got enough of them actually helping us say what we think is important. And unless we get the senior economists in the country to agree with us, the Treasury aren't going to agree. The Bank of England's not going to agree, is it? I mean, this is this point that we had before about how it's not enough to just rely on a groundswell of, of popular, your point, um, to, mm. to, to make change happen. The, the other sort of crucial part of this is, you're quite right, um, meeting with MPs directly and trying to persuade them, but also persuading the people that, whose, whose opinion they value most highly, which is um, senior economists, the people who sort of set the intellectual agenda and determine what is kind of conventional wisdom. Um, so you're absolutely right that like reaching out, reaching out to and convincing and getting the kind of ambassadorship of uh, eminent economists is, is, is crucial. Yeah. How I are you going to do that? Well, I was going to say, just in with that, stakeholder mapping, stakeholder yeah. analysis, and then you've got strategy. You know. um, Can I just say, my, my, uh, my brother's just finished writing a book on, on policy, and what he did for the research was to go around to talk to captains of industry, top bankers, and all the rest of it. Um, and these are people who are not on the whole going to be in favour of positive money because they, they have vested interests. Mm -hmm. But what he discovered was that there are very large numbers of these people that know that the system is screwed. Mm -hmm. They really don't like it. They're ambivalent. They can see perfectly well how disastrous growing inequality is, for example. Lots of them, but they won't go public. But he, he got the impression that if these people... Um, were if, if there were certain circumstances, cer certain modes of assistance to these people, and above all what he calls a new elite, mm. that is to say people who are uh, uh, currently outsiders but are well qualified to become insiders, that those people could be extremely useful, that is to say then we're not faced with this solid block of deaf, um, insensitive, self-serving people. A lot of these people actually uh, feel a bit isolated, but they know that there's something badly wrong with the system, and they're powerful and influential. We're, we're kind of we getting close to nine o'clock. Can I ask, in particular, if people who haven't had the chance to say anything and yeah. would like to say something, would like to ask a question, do, do please. Who hasn't said anything and would like to think? say something? Something. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Uh, fine. No. Oh, that's good then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, it was picking up on the sort of the economics education. So I say, yeah, at the end of a, an economics degree, I think most people still wouldn't be able to answer any of the questions you raised. Certainly in terms of, I've probably had maybe two or three hours on money in the whole of the degree. I taught some of it um, this year on the macro one course. I had quite a large argument with the macroeconomics professor that just wasn't prepared to teach it. And um, one of the other tutors also was at the Bank of the England last year. Mm -hmm. and we just we just weren't prepared to to tell that story. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a huge issue is is not only that it doesn't get discussed, but also the stuff that does get to is wrong. Uh, and then yeah, in terms of linking it into the sort of wider movement. Uh, so economy is kind of like a came off rethinking economics, which is sort of the main one. Economy is sort of their outreach of sort of how they inform people, how they change people's minds and, and try and educate people about different ways of doing economics. Um, I think it's a little bit harsh to say that positive money hasn't got endorsements from major economists. I mean, the ones that you put up at the start, a lot of those are quite influential figures, so I thought it was a little bit harsh. Um, but I think in terms of within the sort of rethinking economics, edu economics education, movement. Andy Haldane, who's now the Chief Economist of Bank of England, mm -hmm. wrote the foreword for the 
post crash report yep. that uh, the students put, did in Manchester. Um, ben Dyson now works there. I spent most of the last year and a half working with him on digital cash. Um, so I think I think there is the possibility to engage with key economists. I think more and more of them are mm. thinking in a different way. But it, 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 it connects with lots and lots of issues about just not understanding how they economy, not even just money, but that's sort of one one of the many things yeah. you know, that is badly misunderstood. So I think it's going to be difficult to get the focus to be on money when you're talking to economists about Canada. Mm -hmm. They're going to be aware of all of the other things yeah. that are also wrong. Yeah. And what kind of do this? Quite difficult to, to keep it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think another problem with, with economists generally is that like, economists will endorse you in a very guarded and caveated way, insofar as yeah. economists are often dedicated their lives to a very specific school or understanding of economics, which, which may or may not take money and its reform into, into its purview. And therefore, there's, there's always a slight sense of like, yes, that's all very good, but what about all of these other things, or you really haven't taken into account this? And that's, that's part of academic discourse. Um, but I do, th I do think that we, we, we have achieved the the endorsement of a lot of leading economists um, and a lot of economic commentators, but there's a lot more to do, no question. Um, and I guess as a sort of summing up remark, um, I mean, thank you all uh, very much for all of your um, input and comments. It's certainly given me, given me a lot to think about, um, particularly as someone who's relatively new to the organisation. I guess I'd say that we, although we've achieved quite a lot, I think, over the last seven, eight years, um, we are still very much a work in progress. We're still quite a new organisation on the scene in, in the sort of uh, broader uh, political spectrum, um, and we're still learning and growing. So please keep talking to us. Please keep giving us your feedback. Please keep coming to events. And most importantly, please keep uh, spreading our, our network. Go and tell five friends that they should sign up to our newsletter and, and just uh, help us grow the amount of people that are listening to our um, ideas. Paul, well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. You will be able to watch this later on YouTube. Oh, God. Really? So you can ask more questions if you like. <laughs> Thanks, George. Yeah.